The things that Pope Francis has done, which contradict what Pope Benedict and John Paul II taught, we simply have to resist it, say, I'm sorry, Holy Father. It's an act of charity to tell someone who's in error that you're in error. We like solutions and problems to go away. There's no easy solution available to say, okay, the Pope is saying bad things, he's no longer the Pope. No, it doesn't work that way. Father Gerald Murray joins us. Uh, praise be to God. Glad to have you back on the show, Father. Thank you for your time today. I would love to say, People asking the question, is the Pope Catholic, was still just a punchline of a joke and not really a conversation that people were having more and more frequently. It's a tragedy. So we see the Father Altman uh, scenario where he's put out these videos saying that the Pope is not the Pope. Where are we at here with all of these arguments? I mean, it, I mean, you're a canon lawyer, Father. So what can be done, if anything, in the scenario that a Pope turns out to endorse teach or or say heresy what do we do about that as catholics joe great to be with you well of course this is a problem because pope francis is said and done things that no pope has ever done and uh last week or two weeks ago when the response to the dubia came out the pope said that pastors sh should discern ways to offer blessings for people who are in same-sex unions as long as those blessings are not confused with a marriage blessing uh, <clears throat> this is a radical departure from Catholic morality. You cannot bless uh, the union of two people who promise to engage in immoral action. Uh, and he, he himself had issued a document or, or had authorized the publication of a document in 2021 saying that you cannot bless sin. So the Pope has changed uh, his teaching about uh, blessing same-sex union, and it's, it's simply wrong. You have to resist it. Now, this is a strange place to be in the life of the church uh, because the Pope is supposed to be the defender of orthodoxy. That's, you know, part of his commission. St. Peter was heard from the Lord who said, confirm your brethren. So his job is to confirm us in the faith, not to teach things that go against it. Now, the question, of course, is what do you do in response? And as with any challenge to the faith, whether it comes from the Pope or someone else, we have to remain faithful to the teaching and resist attempts to change the teaching. Now the question of cause as a canon lawyer is, uh, what, does, what are the canonical implications for the Pope embracing something that denies Catholic teaching? And some people claim that he loses the pontificate. Uh, and that is of course um, an opinion. I don't believe that's the uh, correct interpretation of it because there is no way to verify uh, against the will of the Pope that, in fact, he is teaching heresy. He doesn't think he is teaching something wrong, otherwise he wouldn't teach it. He thinks that this is something that is in conformity with Catholic teaching. Earlier, you may remember, he said, civil government should have civil unions for homosexuals. Um, the Church has always said no to that because it doesn't want to promote, in any way, people committing sin with each other. So the canonical question becomes, how do you verify that the Pope has fallen into heresy? Because in canon law, there's an automatic excommunication for people who are fallen into heresy, schism, or apostasy. Now, it's up in the usual canonical order, it's up to the Pope to make a declaration that someone has in fact fallen into heresy. So for himself to fall into heresy, there's no superior level of judgment over the Pope to say he has done so. Now, it would be a different matter if the Pope voluntarily, uh, you know, quit the church. Let's say the Pope, I hope this would never happen. Let's say the Pope said, I now believe in the Islamic faith, and I no longer believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and the Savior, and I'm renouncing that. Uh, well, that would be very simple to say he's, he's no longer the Pope because he's renouncing the faith. If you don't have the faith, uh, you've apostatized and you've made it clear that you re reject that. He's not trying to claim that Islam is the fulfillment of Christianity. He's saying Christianity in that case would be wrong. So that case, he would lose the office. Uh, but in the case of saying something such as the church should bless homosexual unions, um, there's nobody to declare that he has in fact committed an act of heresy according to the code of canon law and therefore has lost the office automatically because when, when you're excommunicated, you lose church office by canon law. Mm. That's an automatic effect. Bishop Schneider, when, when I talked to him, he said, he said, basically said the same thing. He said, 
all we're left with is a future pope, a future council could condemn him, and and that would be you know what it is. So because there's no means by which to judge a sitting pontiff. And I'm guessing that's basically what you just said. So we get confused. We see what's going on. And we're just like, is there, is there anybody still in charge over there? Because their discussions don't seem to be reined in by doctrine or dogma. Right. Well, yeah, I do agree with uh, Bishop Schneider. And uh, what are we supposed to do? Well, number one, the Pope is the Pope. Uh, number two, we don't have to agree with things that he says when they contradict Catholic teaching. Uh, we can certainly point to the same arguments, uh, you know, being made by dissenters to Pope John Paul II and Benedict. And they said, no, we can't bless homosexual unions. No, we can't give communion to divorce and remarried people. Uh, no, the death penalty is not immoral. So the things that Pope Francis has done, uh, which contradict what Pope Benedict and John Paul II taught, it's very sorrowful that he's doing it. We simply have to resist it, say, I'm sorry, Holy Father. I respect you, but my respect also includes affirming you in the truth by saying what you're doing is wrong. Now, people say, oh, that's rude and, and uh, you shouldn't do that. But manners is not the, the purpose of Christian life. Uh, we're not here to pretend, for instance, that uh, something that's wrong is right simply because the man in charge thinks it's right. Uh, it's an act of charity to tell someone who's in error that you're in error. Uh, now, I, <clears throat> what people like in... You know, this is something I, I, we all like. We like solutions and problems to go away. But, yes. you know, there's no easy solution available to say, okay, the Pope <laughs> is saying bad things. He's no longer the Pope. No, it doesn't work that way. Bishop Schneider pointed out that currently 100%, to include the Dubia Cardinals, have all recognized Francis as Pope, I believe, rightly so. Well, let me ask you, uh, as a canon lawyer, Father Murray, what if... Some of the cardinals, let's just say it was the Dubia cardinals. What if some of those cardinals came back and said, we no longer recognize Francis as pope? Would that change your assessment of how all of this would work? Uh, it would not because cardinals don't have a canonical power to uh, declare that the pope is no longer the pope. They don't have that power. They may have that opinion as a group or individually, um, but they don't have the power to do that. So... The only power that is over the Roman pontiff is God and his own will. So if he dies, he loses office, of course, because he, he, he's, he leaves uh, this life. If he resigns by his own free will choice, he loses office uh, because he's decided, as Pope Benedict did, that he no longer wanted to continue to be uh, the pope. Uh, but there's no mechanism for a group of cardinals or bishops to simply declare, I'm sorry, you're no longer mm. the Pope. Uh, we're taking the keys away. You got to move out of St. Peter's. Um, now, the Pope, as I said earlier, if he declared himself publicly that he rejected Christianity, well, then that's a de facto resignation from the pontificate. Uh, but we could say, legally speaking, if he himself judges that Christianity is no longer true, then he has incurred the penalty of excommunication. In fact, he wouldn't even recognize such a penalty to exist because he no longer wants to be associated with Christianity. So that would be a case where if the Pope said, I'm no longer the Pope I'm uh, because I now believe in Isla the Islamic religion, uh, then if he said, but I continue to want to live in St. Peter's and, and uh, tell you people what to do as Catholics, then you would be entitled to ignore him at that point. Some have made the argument that Pope Francis, or rather Pope Benedict XVI, God rest his soul, his resignation was invalid. And uh, some have also made the argument that the uh, the conclave that elected Pope Francis ha had a lot of shenanigans involved. There was a lot of lobbying that was going on, and they were ignoring canon law that regards that. If Let's just assume for the sake of the conversation that both of those scenarios are true. Does that therefore invalidate the current pontificate? For the sake of the conversation, well, again, you have a problem because um, how do you verify— it, it, to, to verify that they were invalidating acts by cardinals that would render the election invalid, uh, there would have to be sufficient evidence to establish that. Um, and, you know, how do you get to that point? Now, as yeah. regards uh, the freedom of the resignation, again, you'd have to have sufficient evidence to show that he was somehow influenced uh, in such a way that he didn't act freely. Um, 
or you would have to have show evidence that he wasn't in his mm. right mind, meaning that he was mentally incapacitated when he did it. Uh, how do you prove those again? <laughs> Very difficult. I, to overturn Very a papal difficult. election is pra practically impossible. But I want to talk and spend these next few minutes talking specifically about the Senate Synod on synodality. I, I watched your interview with Fall with Raymond Rorio and uh, Robert Royal over at the World Over Live on Thursday. It was a great interview. There were so many things that came up that I really wanted to follow up on. It seems to me that in the press briefings that have happened so far on the Synod on synodality, and make the world think that what is going on there is along the lines of this progressive agenda. Do you think that they are intentionally trying to craft that message or am I just reading too much into it? No, you're right, Joe. That's what's happening. It's a very controlled environment. Uh, the participants are not allowed to publish their interventions or their comments. Uh, they're not allowed to describe what other people say. Uh, the press conferences, uh, I, I went to one of them when I was in Rome, uh, and the head of the Vatican Dicastery for Communication said that the, the Synod speaks, the Synod is a body. So therefore, there's a unified message. We're not interested in simply the individual opinions of the people there, but the synod has to speak as a body. And I reject that completely. If anything, the synod is a place where people gather together and uh, each give their contribution. And there are going to be contrasts, contradictions, and, and uh, affirmations of agreement depending on what people say. And that's normal and good. Uh, we don't need an echo chamber. So I think there's a great amount of control happening, and that indicates a fear. I think they're afraid that uh, if the word gets out that people don't support all of these progressive agenda items, that therefore the legitimacy of the final document, uh, if, which is perhaps going to affirm some of that stuff, would then be called into question. Like they keep talking about, well, we want to be led by the Spirit. We want to have an open conversation and let the Spirit do what He wills. It seems to me like they keep bringing this line up all the time as though it's sort of like a like a, a way to rationalize or legitimize any type of direction they want to take. It seems like they're blaming the Holy Ghost for their progressive agenda. Well, I think that's exactly what's happening here. This claim that the Holy Spirit's the protagonist of the synod is a way to short circuit any disagreement what comes out at the end when the when the document writers produce a document and the claim is well this is because the protagonist the holy spirit prompted this uh, every catholic in the world should say no revelation closed with the death of the last apostle the presence of the holy spirit in the life of the church is a doctrine of the faith but it doesn't mean that any specific act by a group of people who come together at a meeting can be ascribed to the will of the Holy Spirit. And this, I'm afraid, is what they're trying to use to justify uh, things such as blessing of homosexual unions, women ordained to the diaconate today and the priesthood tomorrow, communion for the divorce and remarried. There's a thing here about making polygamists feel welcome. Are we now allowed, supposed to tolerate polygamy in the life of the church? So items which are in clear contradiction with the Catholic faith Catholic morality, uh, they don't come under the guise of the Holy Spirit's inspiration. So I'm very glad Cardinal Zen has written a couple of letters in which he makes this point. This is sort of, it's like a gimmick. Say, well, we're going to pray silently for three minutes at the tables, and then uh, we're going to let the Holy Spirit guide us in what we're going to say. Well, <laughs> you know, if you had three Mormons at the table and they started teaching Mormon doctrine, would we say that's what the Holy Spirit intends? Of course not. Mm. Uh, the Holy Spirit's presence will be viewed and as far as the, the discussion is faithful to Catholic teaching. Many are feeling like there's a, a, a foregone conclusion here, that this is just all a formality. At the end of the day, they're going to recommend to His Holiness what they want in this progressive agenda. And His Holiness, who's made some statement about this being a continuation of Vatican II, is simply going to rubber stamp that. Do you think that'll happen? Well, it's been revealed that the principal writers of the document are people who were involved in writing uh, the uh, instrument in laboris, the working document. So uh, the, if this really is a synodal assembly of bishops, then bishops themselves should write their own document, uh, not rely on experts, so-called expert staff, who are unaccountable because they're not publicly known. You know, Now it's been uh, Edward Penton, has done some reporting that two of the, the principal writers 
uh, are people who have theologically shaky, in fact, contradictory positions. They'd be happy if women were ordained, for instance. Uh, <laughs> this is where we're going. And that's why resistance from on the outside is so important, because we can't say a charade uh, where bishops are now on equal voting uh, status with lay people, that this is an act of the Episcopate's representative. No, this is an act of the people that Pope Francis has invited to the Synod and approved their presence of. And quite frankly, uh, where are the people like the Latin Mass at this Synod? You know, this hasn't come up. It's come up at the uh, press conference. Diane Montaigne asked a question about it. And she was told, well, the Latin Mass people haven't been excluded from the church. <laughs> Tell that to the yeah. people who can't go to Latin Mass anymore. So I, right, exactly. this is the wrong answers are being given here. Uh, I know about synods from the past. They produce some beautiful documents. I'm very worried what's going to come out of this one. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.